What is the effect of out of control federal spending and debt on the American people? Join Richard Eveline and me in this week's Libertarian Angle as we examine that question. Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and this is this week's Libertarian Angle, the show that you all know brings you the principled case for the libertarian philosophy, and we have for some 34 years. I'm joined by my co-host to the Libertarian Angle, Richard Ebeling. Richard, good to see you again. It's good to see you and to be with our viewers and listeners always. All right. And if you're new to FFF, come and visit us at FFF.org for 34 years of good, solid, principled arguments on libertarianism uh, in the form of both articles and conferences and the rest. Okay, Richard. So the Wall Street Journal comes out with an editorial this a uh, couple of days ago that talks about federal spending and to a certain extent taxes as well. Let, let me let me point out some of the highlights. Uh, the big highlight is in the first six months of the fiscal year, the federal government's fiscal year, the deficit, that is the amount of money that the government is spending versus the amount of money that the government is receiving in tax revenues is $1.064 trillion. In other words, the government is spending $1 trillion more than what it's bringing in in taxation. We already know that the amount of the national debt is around $34 trillion. So that's gonna be adding another trillion dollars to the national debt. Now, why is the national debt important? Well, one reason is pointed out in this editorial that because the Federal Reserve was raising interest rates to combat the overexpansion of the money supply is reflected in price inflation or price increases, uh, the debt that the government's got to pay on its debt, I mean, the interest it's got to pay on its $34 trillion in debt is soaring too. In fact, the editorial points out that the amount they're paying for interest now exceeds what they're paying, they call it for defense, but that's a ridiculous word, for the military intelligence establishment and all of its foreign adventurism and foreign military bases. So they're kind of stuck there. What do they do? If they want to lower their interest payments, the Fed's going to have to lower interest rates, but we already know that price inflation is increasing. So the Fed's kind of stuck. Um, but we also know that that's what the Fed does, has for decades. It pays off the debt with cheap and debased dollars. Now, what's interesting also is they say the usual suspects are behind it, namely Medicare payments, which climbed 10%, and Social Security benefits, which rose 9%. Well, there, there's another suspect here that the, the Wall Street Journal doesn't mention. They're, they're conservatives, and that's the military intelligence establishment. They're up to what, eight, 800 um, billion at this point, almost a trillion dollars there for, for their uh, military related adventurism. So is this a result of lower taxes that taxes are just not being recovered? No, actually the, the editorial points out that they, uh, they had an increase in tax revenues. Uh, let me see if I can find it here. Uh, let's see, I can't find it, but I know it's, it's in here where tax revenues actually increased. Oh yeah, the problem isn't the short of tax revenues, which rose 7% from a year earlier to 2.19 trillion. So of course, you know, this is standard conservatism, standard mainstream uh, uh, commenting on out of control federal spending because they don't suggest what needs to be done here. Oh, it's the standard response. Oh, we need to cut spending. We need to cut spending. But when you and I, for example, say, well, why don't we just abolish Medicare? Why don't we just abolish Social Security? Oh, man, the mainstream press goes ballistic. Oh, my gosh, Jacob, people would be dying in the streets. The seniors are dependent on the money. Once you get hooked on socialism, you have to keep the socialism. And you say, and then we say, well, why don't we dismantle the national security establishment, bring all the troops home, discharge? Oh my gosh, no, no, no. National security would be at stake. We'd be taken over by the Muslims and the communists and the illegal immigrants and the drug dealers and the terrorists. And so 
what they end up doing is saying, well, maybe we should abolish food stamps or aid to the arts, you know, this minuscule part of the, of the budget, relatively speaking. But that's goring somebody else's ox. And if, if you're going to keep your favorite government programs, then how do you argue against other people that said those are our favorite government programs? So I think, Richard, there's a good possibility that we're reaching the point where there's going to be a major crisis here. And, and I know, you know, there have been libertarians saying this for quite some time, but you never can get the timing right on these crises. It's just a matter of logic. When you're spending more than you're bringing in and your debt is mounting and mounting and your, your interest payments are now exceeding your military intelligence expenditures, which are huge, that doesn't bode well. I mean, we can look at other countries like uh, Greece and Italy, where this happened, where they they essentially go bankrupt. They have to be bailed out. They can't cover their expenditures with their tax revenues. Or Argentina is another example, where in, in price inflation was, I don't know, 80, 90 percent or something like that, uh, because the central bank was printing the money to pay off all the debts and the expenditures and so forth. Uh, so this cannot end well. And this is what the welfare warfare state way of life has done to us, Richard. It, it's put us in a position where Things are not going to end up well here. It's just a matter of when, not if. What do you think? Well, let me sort of uh, elaborate on a few of these things. The, the, uh, a starting point, I would suggest, is that if we ask what is the burden of government, it isn't what it's taxing, but as Milton Friedman would always hammer away, it's what it's spending. The total spending is a reflection of the amount of the society's wealth, resources, uh, income, that the government siphons away from the private sector, from uh, from the, from the freedoms to choose by uh, the citizens of the country, and so uh, uh, it is true that the de the deficits represent the amount that the government is spending above taxes, as if that that, that, that per se is the problem. The problem is the spending part, and let's suppose that we were to look at it a different way. Let us suppose that that extra $1 trillion, approximately, that the government has spent uh, in excess of taxes had, in fact, been paid for by raising taxes. And let's suppose they were spending all this money with a balanced budget. Would we be happy with that, Jacob? I don't think so. Because we would just say, that, look here, that's an extra trillion dollars that's been siphoned out of the private sector's productive earned incomes and abilities to have freedom of choice. Well, if the government borrows the money, that's siphoning money through the financial markets, dollar for dollar for the same amount as if they had taxed it. So ultimately, what's important is, is, is not so much whether it's been taxed or it's been borrowed, there, though there are different impacts looking beyond that. But the, the burden of government is what it spends, because that's the degree in which they are really ultimately picking our pockets. Uh, the other element, which, 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 as you pointed out, and, and this is this is not something you know new. The Congressional Budget Office, that is the uh, branch of basically statisticians and uh, economist uh, uh, policy wonks, who work jointly for Congress, uh, Republicans and Democrats. They're the number crunches. If this is the legislation. Uh, what are the government expenditures going to be? If this is the tax structure, what's the taxes going to be? Uh, what's going to be taken in? What's going to go out? Will there be a deficit? How much will that add to the debt? They're just the number crunchers. But for a long time now, and especially over the last couple of years, when they look at the degree to which government spends in taxes, and they, and they see verbally in graphs that they put in their monthly reports or quarterly reports, the gap between the two, uh, the fact they're projecting that by uh, 10 years from now, that's around 2034, 2035, that the government is going to be borrowing on average uh, well over $2 trillion a year above what it's taxing. And out of that approximately $2 trillion deficits uh, borrowing, uh, 60 to 65% will be money that's been borrowed by the federal government not to cover current expenditures over taxes. That is, jet fuel for Air Force One, uniforms for American soldiers, standing on the parapets of freedom in Germany, 
or et cetera, et cetera, or a welfare payment for someone. No, 60 to 65% of the money that is borrowed 10 years from now will be money borrowed just to pay in the interest on all of the accumulated debt. Wow. In other words, we're going to be borrowing this huge sum of money. That is, the government will be borrowing this huge sum of money just to stay current with all of the interest they owe on the decades of deficit spending of the past. Well, th that's outrageous. As I tell my students, let's suppose you've maxed out your credit cards and you have your monthly payments of principal and interest, and you've maxed out your cards so high that, in fact, when you all add up, the interest payments are larger than the extent to which you're you're paying off your principal and you don't have enough money coming in as your income to pay that so you take out a new credit card to use to pay all the all the interest payments on the old credit cards and then the new credit card get maxed out and you need to get one more credit card well eventually the financial institutions will look at your situation and say hey we're not ra raising your limit on an existing credit card and we're not going to issue a new credit card it is an unsustainable financial situation. And I say to my students, would you consider that a, a healthy uh, uh, income position to be, to be put in and a debt situation to be put in? Of course not. But this is the path that the US government is following. And as you said, countries like Greece, a variety of Latin American countries of which Argentina over the decades has been a stereotype, the US is heading for that. Now, whereas Greece was able to, you know, uh, you know, do crocodile tears and, and sing the blues and the European uh, Central Bank and, and, and the uh, International Monetary Fund and the World Bank uh, came with, 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 with uh, 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 band-aids and, and covered this over with, with loans and sort of put the pressure on the Greek government to slightly moderate what it was spending on to try to balance the books a little bit more. Who's going to come and do this for the United States? You think the Chinese and the Russians are going to do this? They hold, particularly the Chinese, hold a large part of this debt, over a trillion dollars of U.S. debt. You think they're going to do this for us? Well, as, as, our, as far as I can tell, the only ones that we're going to be able to appeal to, to bail us out of this debt crisis, like these third world countries go begging us, is going to be, oh, Saturn, Neptune, Pluto, Mars. That's it. Hello, way out there. Well, basically means that there will be a point when this reaches crisis. And as you were saying, who the hell knows when? Who the hell knows when? Nobody has a crystal ball to say, oh, that's the straw that breaks the camel's back in these financial and, and, and debt problem situations. But if this, if this is continuing to go on like this, this is the burden we have. And there's also the fact that it, it's not only that, that the resources that are borrowed are siphoning out of the private sector in general. They're siphoning savings out of the financial markets that otherwise would have gone on, gone into borrowing to private sector investors to a great extent, making new goods and services, expanding plant and equipment, investing in and doing research for new technologies and innovative and better ways to produce goods and services. It is through savings, investment, and capital formation that in the long run, a society increases its productive capacity to expand the production of more of the goods and services, more, better, and different kinds to improve our standard of living as members of the society. To the extent that those scarce savings resources are siphoned away from the private sector borrowing and investing activities and to the hands of government, by that extent, we're slowing down. In fact, retarding greatly the capacity for all of us to have better lives through private sector use of the resources that are there. That means that our standards of living will be worse in the future than they hypothetically could have been. You could be still moving forward, but you're moving forward, let's say at 20 miles an hour, when hypothetically you could have been moving forward at 30 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour. You may still be a bit ahead, but you're not further along where you hypothetically could have been, and therefore you're falling behind. Now, the, the other thing is that, that is important in this, if I can just add this as well, Jacob, which is what you were saying, that the, the, two, the two largest elements in the government's spending is Social Security and health care, Medicare, Medicaid, Obamacare. 
uh, by themselves, this these eat up almost half of all the government spending, the, the entitlement programs, the core uh, welfare redistributive programs. Uh, and as you were pointing out, uh, a, a third behind them is, is this accumulated de debt payments we have to make. But either about equal to the debt payments or just a very close fourth is the military industrial complex. We are spending and projected to spend well over $800 billion. And given the intent to expand our alliances uh, in Asia, re reinforcing our alliances with South Korea and Japan recently, Philippines, uh, the, 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 the pressure on Congress, uh, in spite of some who are reluctant to do so, to fund more spending, to bolster Ukraine, uh, Israel, uh, to add to our defense uh, spending, uh, for Europe through the through NATO, uh, th this is going to be larger in the future and not less. So the fact is is that it's not just the social welfare programs which everybody sort of points a finger at. Though as you were pointing out, nobody wants to cut. Uh, it's the fact that 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 the garrison state, the global military and and diplomatic empire, that the United States insists upon persisting with, and manning the barricades for and subsidizing all of those who we want to be our partners in this in this global empire. Th this is draining us just as much and as seriously enough as the domestic welfare redistributed programs that, that, that conservatives wring their hands about, just as many libertarians obviously do, but which they don't want to refer to and see the same thing when it comes to the military side as well. Yeah, you've raised a lot of good points. Uh, Another aspect of this is the debt ceiling debate, but it relates because when when the debt ceiling the debt ceiling is an acknowledgement by Congress that too much debt is a bad thing. Now, when even Congress is saying too much debt's a bad thing, uh, that says something. And when the debate comes up, you and I always address it that the the all the chicken littles are coming out saying, "Oh, there's going to be a default, default, default. We have to raise the debt ceiling," which is saying. There's got to be more debt. There's got to be more debt. And they do this every time. But notice that as soon as they win and they get the debt ceiling raised, they don't start saying, hey, we need to cut now and in preparation for the new ceiling that's coming up. Instead, they uncork the champagne bottles and they laugh and they say, no problem. We'll just do this again. We'll do the sky is falling in, default, default the next time around. We don't need to cut any spending or uh, put a debt ceiling on or because we can do it again this, the next time. Now, wait, your, your point is really a great one, the economic point of what they're doing when they're taking, confiscating really this massive amount of money, either through directly through the income tax or siphoning it out, borrowing money. They're still taking it out of the private sector. And what the effect this has on standards of living and, and your point is very good is that okay people say well gosh things aren't so bad i got a house i got a car i go on vacations standard of living is pretty good but what is unseen in all this is how unbelievably fantastic people would have been off in standard of living wise if the government had not been doing this for the last hundred years and that takes us back to the real the, the founding economic principles of this country we know there were some bad founding principles like slavery and so forth, but there were some good founding principles. And one of those was there was no income tax and there was also no paper money, no, no Federal Reserve, no central bank. So they couldn't print the money like they've been doing ever since the Federal Reserve was established in 1913. So you've got a century, more than a century, where people are keeping everything they earned. And that by the time you get to the late 1800s and early 1900s, you have this explosion of standard of living. I mean, you know, tens of thousands of penniless immigrants were flooding American shores every day. Many of them couldn't even speak English. And they were going from rags to riches in one or two, three generations because Americans discovered the key to ending poverty. That if you get government out of this business of confiscating wealth because there was no income tax, People kept everything they earned. You have this massive accumulation of savings. It goes into the banks. The employers are borrowing that money to go and get productive capital, tools, equipment. That makes the workers more productive. Revenues are rising. 
Wage weights then get paid through the competitive process of the labor market. Everybody's benefiting from this unbelievably economically prosperous system. All that comes to an end when the income tax comes in, because now government can confiscate as much as it wants. They sold the income tax as a, as a way to uh, tax only the rich. That's what they said. We're only going to tax the super rich, the billionaires. And well, look where we are now. I mean, the middle class is the one that bears the big burden. But this massive confiscation of capital, what it has done to people's standard of living and what that standard of living could have been is incredible. But finally, Richard, there's the freedom argument, is that Americans discovered that if you're going to truly be considered free, you've got to have the right to keep everything you earn and decide for yourself what to do with it. And so there was no social security, there was no Medicare, there was no socialism. People decided for themselves, do I want to help my parents or not? Do I want to help uh, others with this massive amount of wealth I'm accumulating or not? And by the way, there was also the greatest outburst of voluntary charity that mankind had ever seen, especially in the late 1800s, early 1900s. When people were free to accumulate wealth, they did good things with it. And but they understood that that's what freedom's about, that you, you're living your life, you're managing your affairs on your own, as compared to the serfdom society where the government says, no, we own what you produce. We decide by setting the percentage or how much we're going to print the money, we decide how much money you're going to be permitted to keep, sort of like an allowance. So what had previously been the citizenry as the master and the government as the servant got averted and inverted. And so that now we are the servants and they are the masters. We exist to serve the collective, Richard. We, when we get our, we go out there and we get our paycheck, it's really designed to support the welfare warfare state. We work for them just like serfs or slaves. Yeah. The difficulty we have in our society, and you were alluding to this, is that when for several generations, um, Americans, and of course, many others in other similar kind of similar situations in other countries, when for several generations, people grew up in, experienced, seemed to be benefiting from all of these welfare redistributive programs. And then someone says, we can't afford this anymore. Uh, it is financially debilitating the future of the country. Or then raise the more fundamental question, which they have never heard raised in their entire life. What the hell is the government in the healthcare business for? What the hell is the government in the retirement business for? What is the government in the public housing business for? What is the government in the regulatory uh, business for, as opposed to leaving people free on these matters? Uh, they're shocked when they hear someone like you or I or people who share our views uh, suggest the unnecessity for and the need to abolish uh, these government programs and and, uh, and departments and redistributive activities. Uh, they, 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 but, but wait a minute, this is how society is. This is how we do things because they have no historical memory. You know, there's no history gene. What your parents or your grandparents experienced and, and learned from in their own life is not genetically passed on to you. The past has to be learned as an intellectual exercise. It's called history. It's called economic history, political history, social history. And people have to have both the opportunity to be told what that history was and to be inspired to have an interest to ask what was done in the past that was different than now. And when things changed, how did that make the situation we take for granted now into such a dubious one? And unless that is awakened in people and they, we do so in a way that makes them want to, uh, learn it, understand it, appreciate it, and therefore want to revert back to those founding principles that you alluded to, upon which the founding fathers tried to leave this country, where government was extremely limited. The fact is, if today the federal government were to do only what is specifically delegated as federal government authority in the original Constitution and the Bill of Rights, obviously, uh, I would estimate that anywhere from 80 to 90 percent of what the government is taxing and borrowing for could be ended. Because the functions and duties and responsibilities of the federal government in the original Constitution 
is a fraction of what over, especially the last hundred years, the government has taken over as its responsibility to care for the people. The founding fathers didn't believe it was the responsibility of, of, of the government to care for the people. The responsibility of government was to secure people in their life, liberty, and honestly acquired property to go about their own lives as they saw, saw fit in free and voluntary association for all imaginable purposes with their fellow citizen inside and outside of the marketplace. That vision of such a limited society, which the average American of the 1860s and 1870s and 1880s would have taken for granted, no longer exists. And Americans have to be totally re-educated and inspired to want it once more. No, I, I think it's it would be much higher than 80 or 90 percent. I think more like 98 percent, because if you look at, let's say, 1890, 1900, there was no income tax. The, the only money they raised was through excise taxes and tariffs. I don't know what and land sales, land sales, land sales. But that can't be very much, Richard, in the larger scheme of things. And your land sales only happens one time. Uh, the the annual expenditures had to be minuscule because you didn't have all these social welfare programs. You you had essentially what the Constitution had called for, which was very minimal functions. Mm -hmm. And you didn't have a national security state, no Pentagon, no CIA, no um, uh, NSA, no massive military establishment. There was a basic military, but it certainly wasn't very expensive, certainly not enough to embroil us in Europe's wars or Asia's wars. And you brought up an interesting point about you know, the aid to Ukraine, um, aid to Israel, where do they get this money? I mean, we, we, we're, we're you know, spending a trillion dollars more than what we're bringing in, $34 trillion in debt. And they say, oh, hey, no problem. We'll just send a, a, a few billion here, a few billion there. All they're doing is just mounting up that debt more and more and more. It's like you, it's like this addiction uh, let's let, but they're addicted to spending other people's money. That's the thing. It's not their own money. It's always easy to spend other people's money. They're spending our money. And the young people of this country ought to be the ones that are really furious about this because, you know, you, they, they talk about student loans and the big debt, the burden that student loans put on people, and they do. But my gosh, they have no conception of the burden that's being put on them with this national debt. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Uh, so if, if your point's well taken, if, if you get rid of all the illegitimate functions uh, that have been adopted since the, the Constitution was enacted, you're talking about minuscule, minuscule expenses, and then you're talking about soaring standards of living, and most important, now you're on the road to freedom. Now you're on the road back to where the citizen is in charge and the government becomes the servant rather than the other way around. Well, according to the government's own income and data, uh, in 1913, the year before the First World War began in Europe, uh, all levels of government took in taxes approximately 8% of the national income, the economic pie of that time, which obviously was a lot smaller, 8%. Out of that 8% of the national income absorbed by all levels of government, only 3% was absorbed and spent by the federal government. It was the local and state governments that were larger, together 5%. So just think of a situation in which you keep 92% of everything you earn. Compared to now, you're lucky if you keep, when you count all state and local taxes, the federal taxes, the implicit taxes uh, that, that pa pass on to you through gasoline taxes and all the other property taxes and everything else, you're lucky if you're middle class, you're lucky if you, if you keep 50% of what you really earned. It all adds up. Now, there's a world of difference between the, the government taking half of what you are, as opposed to the federal government only taking 3% you are. And that's because that 3% represented, while the government is already edging up and doing things that a real classical liberal libertarian would be wondering about. In, in 1913, the government wasn't doing that much more than what it had done 30 years later when it was uh, still closer to the original constitution. So it was nothing. And that meant that America could be, could be not only free, but as prosperous and growing as it was. Yeah, ab absolutely. And so what we really need to be 
getting Americans to ask is, what should be the legitimate role of government in a free society? That should be the question on every single person's mind. Do we really need Social Security? Do we really need Medicare? Do we really need the National Security Establishment? Do we really need this empire of military bases, foreign interventionism, foreign wars? The whole welfare warfare state needs to be questioned. The drug war, the regulatory state. And that if people come to the right conclusion on these things, you don't need all the taxation anymore. As you alluded to in the very beginning, this is a spending problem. It's, it's, yes. That's the root of the problem. And people need to question the, the things that these, this money is being spent on. And, but that's our task now, because if, if, if we are concerned not only about our own futures, but that of our children and grandchildren who will be living well into and even perhaps beyond this, this uh, 21st century, uh, we have to be starting to grapple with now so that our our descendants can have a far better life than we seem to be facing ourselves right now. All right. On that fine note, we'll wrap things up. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Thanks you for your continued support of our work here at the Future of Freedom Foundation. If you're new, subscribe to our FFF Daily, which we've sent out for many, many years now, which we strive to make the best libertarian commentary page on the internet. Our monthly journal that Richard writes for every month, as I do, and um, love to have you join us and subscribe to that. So, Richard, uh, as always, greatly enjoyed the visit and the conversation, and uh, look forward to talking to you next week. Until next time. Mm -hmm.